Hey, I don't mind telling you as we close, uh, you know, we uh, several questions about the bill, and we want to aggressively attack that loan as much as we can. So anything given above and beyond, uh, we, we're, we would love to go down to the bank and hand them a check. Y'all hear me? We'd love. We'll take food stamps. <laughs> I will. So we, we want that paid off. So any way we can do that, we will want to do it. Hey, let's pray. And thank y'all for a good meeting, all right? Father, we love you. And God, is, as Brother Gene said, this is necessary. We, we may look at it, but uh, God, this is a part of who we are, how we function. And uh, money is a big part of that. And how to do ministry costs money. Uh, dead churches don't cost anything. Churches alive and are moving and growing cost money. And we're thankful that, God, you have blessed us to the extent that you have. So, Lord, I pray this year that we'd be fiscally responsible, we'd be financially obedient in our giving to you as the Lord of our life, and that, Father, this year we'd see some amazing things, not only just in numbers of money, but in people. So, Father, we do pray for Eric and Amanda as they get ready to travel in the morning. Give them safety. And, Father, we thank you for all that you've done in Jesus' name. And the church said, thank you guys for this time. Bless you all.
Hey, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, we're glad you're here today. Hey, we're going to start off a little bit different this morning. Uh, ladies in the bulletin, if you picked up a bulletin, in a couple of weeks we're going to start a ladies' Bible group called Gideon. And uh, Miss Mary Peppers, Mary, would you stand up and kind of wave? She's going to be facilitating this, so if you have any questions, y'all look at me. Don't call me. Call Mary. Her, is her number in the bulletin? Yes. So call her. Here's a video promoing that. We'll be doing that for about two weeks, and then it'll start. It tells you all the dates and stuff in the bulletin. So we're going to start off a little different this morning. Roll it, maestro. Ladies, this is just for you. Someone asked me, what was my inspiration for writing the Gideon Bible study? It really all began when I was just in my personal quiet time and I ran across that very familiar story of Gideon and the 300 standing against the enemy. And when I came to the story of Gideon, I realized that he was familiar enough to be intriguing, but still obscure enough that he was somewhat of a mystery. There was so much about his story that I didn't know and I wanted to know more. And then of course that whole business of the underdog being victorious, I know how it feels to be insecure, to feel weak, to feel outnumbered, but God shows us through this story that he can take your little bit and make it a lot. That in our weakness, in my weakness, he demonstrates his perfect strength. That's a lesson I wanted to learn and share with others. The story of Gideon really seems like such a man's story, doesn't it? It's got all the elements that make it sound so manly and masculine, like torches and trumpets and enemy and war and battle and victory. But tucked underneath all of that, there is a story for me and you, for God's women. Because here's a guy who felt insecure. He felt outnumbered. He felt like what he had, the capabilities and resources he had, were not enough. I don't know any woman, starting with me, that hasn't felt that. When we look at our careers or our ministries or motherhood, marriage, singleness, oftentimes we feel like we are not equipped for the task at hand. There is a lesson for God's women to learn through the story of Gideon. Do you know what I've gained from the study of Gideon? I've gained a new appreciation for the more familiar stories of the Bible. Sometimes we come to a page of scripture or a passage of scripture or a biblical character that we've heard about before, and we think maybe we know everything there is to know about that person or what God did in his life. But studying Gideon has reminded me that the riches of scripture are so deep and so profound that there is always more insight, not only for us to know, but then to have seared in our hearts so that we can live differently as a result of it. And my hope for you is that you will come away from this Bible study being completely transformed and changed internally and externally. But not only that, that you'll have a brand new appreciation for the scriptures like you never have before. I have the privilege of writing Bible studies like this one on Gideon, um, really while I'm in the midst of everyday living. So while I'm trying to figure out what's for breakfast for the kids and what's for dinner and running errands and folding the laundry, literally in the midst of that, I am trying to study at my dining room table and write when I have a few moments. And as you can imagine, I'm sure, I often feel like I just don't have enough energy to do the project that is in front of me. I don't have enough time. I feel depleted of resources. Gideon's story, is teaching me, was teaching me as I studied and is still teaching me now that, that our weakness, our depleted resources is exactly what we're being asked to submit to God. And when we do, he uses our weakness as a platform for the demonstration of his strength. And you know, not only that, but I got to tell you over these months that I've been writing and studying, the enemy has gone out of his way to highlight my insecurities, to try to paralyze me with fear and intimidation. And Gideon is teaching me that I don't have to let the enemy have his way and neither do you. I love, I love to read about Gideon in God's Word, and, and as I'm reading it, I'm always asking God, you know, how can I be more like Gideon um, and the way that he faced difficulties and the way that he handled things? Because I'm just going to tell you right now, going to Walmart takes all the Jesus I got. <laughs> I, I am telling you right now. <laughs> I got to have Jesus turned way up to go to Walmart. Mm-hmm. Bless her heart, Leah. <laughs> we, we went yesterday, and Leah was almost like, do we need to leave? <laughs> I'm like, no, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. But thank, the, thank God for Gideon, right? Amen. And thank God for his word that is true and real and, and, and new. Every time I read it, I learn something different, don't I? Yeah, let's stand up and, and join our voices together this morning and begin our worship time together. Oh, 
I'm going to try this one more time this morning. I want you to look to your neighbor, look at your neighbor, and say, are you leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus this morning? Come on, let's sing. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, come on, oh, how sweet. Oh, how sweet to walk. announcements, things that you need to know about. First of all, we mentioned the ladies' Bible study group. As you exit the building today on the long uh, desk out there, there are sign-up sheets, so please go by and do that. That way, if you need to get material ordered or whatever, please go by and do that. Your weakness, God's strength. And so if you want more information, please call Miss Mary Pepler. And Miss Mary, thank you for doing that, committing to the Lord to do that. Thank you for your faithful giving to the Light of Moon Christmas offering. We'll do that for about two more weeks. We've already doubled what we gave last year to the Light of Moon Christmas offering, and we just praise God. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, coming up, there's going to be a Mission 25 silent auction. They have several things back in the back that we're just doing some what we call spring cleaning. Uh, if you'll go on, you can find all that in the bulletin. I won't, I won't go through all that, but if there's some stuff there that you might want to be a part of, it will support our Mission 25. So please do that. Hey, today, excuse me, tomorrow's the day. Uh, Pastor Eric and Miss Amanda will be getting on a plane at 6 a.m. in the morning. They'll be headed to Guatemala. So we want to be praying for them. Uh, they wish they could be here today, but they are, they are packing as we speak. Uh, I talked to him Friday, and I said, how's it going? He said, I'm so far behind. It looks like I'm going to leave all my clothes, and I'm just going to have to get on the plane. So they are uh, they're packing with panic, all right, and praying at the same time. Hey, would you do me a favor? If uh, Pastor Eric and Miss Amanda are least listening, and I'm sure they are, 
Would you give them a good hand clap of praise? We're praying for you and love you. Amen. Bless you. And um, he'll, uh, he's going to try to send back a, a little video clip next week just telling you about uh, things that are going on. So in the morning, they'll be going. So please pray for them as they travel and ask God to give them grace and mercy. And he's a beautiful note on the uh, uh, website where you can go and say thank you for the great pleasure, one of the greatest pleasures of life serving here and so forth and so on. Our youth are in good hands. I appreciate David Marcou. And there's about four or five couples helping him, uh, Chris Peppers and many others, Mr. Creasy. So whoever's helping out with the youth right now, we appreciate you so the youth are in good hands. So we continue to pray and ask the Lord to be with them. But we will miss Eric and Amanda and the kids, and we're just trusting them into the Lord's care, okay? Hey, this morning at 930, we had what's called, we'd call a business meeting. We looked at the new budget. You can pick those up on the table to my left as you go out the door. Next Sunday morning, now listen carefully, next Sunday morning, we've already discussed it. If you have any questions, pick one up, call the church office this week, you can contact us, or we'll call the finance committee. If you have any questions about any of the line items, we'll be happy to address those for you, okay? But next Sunday, we won't be discussing it. We've already done that. Next Sunday morning after this service, uh, we'll just, uh, in affirmation, say thank you to the finance committee for the hard work they've done, so join us doing that. But please pick up a copy as you leave today. And you can see all those items and, and the changes in the budget. It'll tell you the 2020 and the 2021. And if you have questions, please call the church office. Hey, before we pray this morning, we got several prayer requests today. Uh, we've been asked to please pray for Jeff and Cindy Jones. They are in their 50s. Both have uh, COVID in the hospital, and they are not doing well. And Miss Sherry Kirk asked us to pray for them, and Miss Sherry will do that. Hey, Miss Dickie Nelson lost her sister Brenda this week, so pray for them uh, as they... Uh, having funerals and things of that nature. Jimmy Jordan's family has been affected by COVID. The Hunt family has been affected by uh, COVID. So we, we just have a lot of folks right now that are uh, just kind of affecting and pray for them. Uh, and then I'm, I'm just hearing through the, through the background, Chris Pepper may have lost his dad. Does anybody know that officially? Is, does that happen? Stepdad, that's okay. So we want to pray for Chris Pepper and his family as they get ready for a funeral as well. Hey, if you're our guest today, it is so good to have you on our camp. I can't really see you with the lights, but if you're here today and you're a guest, church, would you welcome any guest? God bless you, and thank you for being here today, and the Lord be with you, okay? Hey, we're going to pray, and uh, hey, I'm excited about the message because I don't know what I'm going to say. Uh, it's really that bad. So Miss Lee said, hey, you got a title? I said, no, I don't even know what book I'm going to be preaching out of, but it's... Uh, Revelation chapter 11, uh, so just hold on. Hey, I, I, and just let me explain, I have a major toothache. They tried to pull it Thursday, couldn't, so I'm on a lot of dope. <laughs> and so if, if I just start babbling, just say amen. Because please, because <laughs> uh, I've got enough numbs in my mouth right now to stop a bull elephant, but uh, we're going to make it. But do pray for the message. I think it's pertinent uh, to speak to us today of where the church is where God is leading in, in prophetic time of the nation of Israel. You do know that the nation of Israel is still in God's prophetic timetable. So today we're going to see it clear and plain. I was picking with you a while ago, but we're going to see it, okay? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We certainly want to pray for all these families that we mentioned. Ask you in Jesus' name, God, to give them grace and mercy. We pray for the Jones family. We pray for the Nelson family. We pray for the uh, Pepper family, for the Hunts and the Jordans. And God, I, I know that there are others in a crowd no bigger than this, God, I, I know there's many silent ones out there, so bless them and minister to them. Father, our hearts and our prayers are with uh, Eric and Amanda Hunt as they get on a plane tomorrow to take, to take their whole family to live in Guatemala. I pray that God's grace and mercy will go before them, and that, Father, you'll open doors, you'll close doors. God, you will. I, I'm praying for preordained ministry, that, God, you would use them for your honor's sake and for your name's sake. So bless them, take care of them. And I want them to know we love them and that we're praying for them. But we're excited to be here today that we can lean on you in these shaky times. I'm glad we're on solid ground. And his name is Jesus. And we praise you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen. amen. God bless you. Okay. 
and I know you will do it again for your promises yes and amen you will do great things you will do great things oh oh hero of heaven you conquer the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh God you have done Our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Oh, sing hallelujah, hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great Hallelujah again. Oh, hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Sing it again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Let's sing it one more time, hallelujah, hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah. He's done some great things in your life. Yeah. Do you think he's going to keep doing great things? Yes, he is. You know, uh, I've had some folks ask me about my mom, and I was able to FaceTime her yesterday. Uh, she is doing better, and uh, I am thankful for that. God does indeed keep answering prayers, and he'll keep answering your prayers too if you call on him. Praise the Lord, you know, for his mercy and his grace and his love. Oh, let's keep, let's keep singing. Come on, sing it with me. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Oh, I love this verse. What love can remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their songs. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Mercy. 
riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood in the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Thank you. Do you love the Lord this morning? Amen. Do you love him? No, I, I, I know, you I know. You know. we use that term love just for everything. Oh, I love Big Macs, and I do. Uh, oh, I love McRib sandwiches. Woo! You know, and I'm just kidding. Do you love the Lord? Amen. Do you love the Lord? You know, it's more, it's more yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's more than just I love this or I love that. It's. It's a full soul, heart, mind. It's a full body of love for the Lord and for what he's done for us. And the fact that he continues to love us, even when we fall on our face every single day, he still loves us. So I'm going to shut up now.
running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life break down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after. Thank you for your mercy this morning because you tell us in your word it's new every morning. And thank you for giving us this morning, Lord. I'd have been happy either way, God. I'm happy that I'm here praising you and I would have been happy to be in heaven praising you there too. There's so many people in our world, God, that if you chose not to give us this day, there's so many people who would miss it. So many people who would miss you. I know this world is not my home and I'm just passing through. And I know this world is in a sad state. But God, you are faithful to those who know you as Lord and Savior. God, you are our hope, our blessed hope. So Father, today as we hear your word, I pray you bless us. Bless Ronnie as he brings the message, Lord. Bless him. That everything he says today, God, will be exactly what you want him to say. And thank you, God, that I've had just had an opportunity to sing of your praises today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, amen. You may be seated. Hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and find your place to the book of Revelation, chapter number 11. Revelation, chapter number 11. Hey, uh, uh, at 63 years old, yesterday I was playing tennis, and uh, I got a text or a Facebook thing and I noticed that my 15 year old grandson now has his permit to drive so watch where you're going (laughs) be careful and then about 10 minutes later my five-year-old grandson called me on the phone and this is what he said he calls me grandpa he said hey grandpa can you FaceTime (laughs) I said son I can barely answer one of these things and he said, well, I'm learning how to pay, play the piano. I want you to watch me. So I got one at 15 drive, and I got another one at FaceTime. I don't know where I fit in this thing, Brother Keith, but I just know I was born way too late. Amen. Uh, this telephone mess is about to kill us all, so it's just a mess. Hey, I, uh, we, we've come to a portion. By the, by the, just, just tell you, I skipped Chapter 10 on purpose. Just don't want to deal with it. <laughs> so you, you, you go back and read it for yourself. But chapter 11 is an interesting, interesting chapter. Now, if you don't hear anything else, I say, listen to me. And and then we're going to fill in some blanks. God has not broken his covenant with Israel. 
God has not forgotten his covenant with Israel. And so God will reestablish that relationship. And we find that in the book of Revelation chapter number 11. As a matter of fact, the reason I believe it, that the church will be raptured before the seven-year tribulation period is because from chapter 5 on, you see or hear no reference of the church. It's primarily for the Jews. God's dealing with the Gentiles are done. He has redeemed those of us who are unnatural of the, of the olive tree. He has grafted us in. And now God is redemptively bringing Israel back to himself through judgment and through wrath. And in chapter 8 and 9 and 10, or 8 and 9, we saw all those horrible, hell has a holiday, and I'm glad we're through with that. That was to rebuke and to warn and to judge the nation of Israel. So in chapter 11, we are on Jewish ground. I need you to hear that. We are on Jewish ground. As a matter of fact, just let me make some quotes. In chapter 11 and 12, we're definitely on Jewish ground. We see the Jewish temple. We're going to see that in just a moment. It will be rebuilt. Number two, in Jerusalem, uh, we, we see the city, excuse me, Jerusalem, chapter 11, verse 8. Here, here's an interesting, for those of you who are bibliologists and you like to study, in chapter 11, verse 19, we find the Ark of the Covenant. It's in the book of Revelation. People want to know where it went. It's in heaven. The Bible tells us. Also, in chapter 12, 5, we see the ruling Christ. In chapter 12, verse 7, we see Michael the archangel fight against Satan. And, and so on and on we could go. We are on Jewish ground. We're on holy ground. And in chapter 11, we see two things I hope that will help us, give us hope. Now, it's interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine, John Powell. He said, Ron, it's amazing. In Revelation, you see the wrath of God. And then in the next chapter, you see the mercy of God. Now, remember, the tribulation period is seven years long. And the church said, amen. All right, we're in the middle. In the first three and a half years, here's some things that's going to take place. Number one. God's going to call 144,000 evangelists. They have been evangelizing for three and a half years. Numbers of people have been saved. Can I say this? I believe that in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, the temple, as of the Old Testament, we, re, we, we not only be rebuilt, but we'll be reestablished. We'll see that right here. As a matter of fact, I spoke with a guy the other day who was in Israel. He said, Ron, I went into a building where they are now training the Levite priest to be ready to offer sacrifices again on the Temple Mount. Don't you listen to me? That is serious business, guys. So we need to wake up to what's going on around us. Some of the things that, pre I'm not being political, but some of the things that President Trump did to remove and realign Israel, it's all there. So in chapter 11, we're in the middle way of the three and a half years, and a lot of stuff has been going on. Now, their, their horses with scorpion tails have been killing people. Two-thirds of the earth population has been killed, but these 144,000 have been preaching the kingdom of the gospel and hundreds and thousands have been saved. How do you know that? Well, I'll show it to you. So here we're going to see the temple and we're going to see the two witnesses. So the temple rebuilt and a revival that will take place under the two witnesses and then what happens to them, all right? So let's read the word of God together, okay? The Bible says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise, measure the temple of God. So what temple is now either that's symbolic or it's literal? Now remember when we started this study, we said there's some things in Revelation you've got to take literally and there's some things that are symbolic. The ten-headed beast coming out of the water is not your wife, guys. So we, we discussed that and all the women forgave me. So when we look at a ten-horned beast, we know that's talking about nations. A little horn's talking about either a king or a president. So we know there's some figurative language in Revelation. I think here he's speaking literal. He said, take this ruler, like Zechariah did, by the way, and Zerubbabel, and measure the temple. So the Bible says either it's literal or it's symbolic. I think it's literal here. I, I'm good for discussion. Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Here's what's going on. Even the Antichrist will allow the temple to be rebuilt, to reestablish worship, for three and a half years, then he's going to come into that temple. He's going to proclaim himself to be God. He's going to commit the abomination of desolation, uh, Matthew 24, uh, Daniel 7. And then he's going to say, hey, you're worshiping the wrong God. I'm God. So the Antichrist allows the Jews to worship in their temple. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out. That's the court of the Gentiles. And measure it not, for it's given to the Gentiles. Our time is over. 
and the holy city, Jerusalem, which they tread under foot 40 and 2 months. Three and a half years, so do all your math. I will give you power unto my two witnesses. So here's the temple rebuilt. Here's the two witnesses preaching revival. Let's look at it, would you please? The Bible says, and I will give you power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score days clothed in sackcloth, three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two candle stands standing before the God of the earth, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of the mouth. So why would he go from a symbolic temple to two literal people in two verses? So I think it's literal. But now I'm, I'm good. If, if you have a, a different interpretation, I'm going to give you a, a, an interpretation in just a moment. You're going to think I'm crazy. That's all right. I'm an Auburn fan. I get a pass. <laughs> Y'all all right. I told somebody right now, I'm so desperate, I'll take Tennessee orange. <laughs> oh, man. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So we know it's talking about two people or, or two entities, and I'll get into that in just a moment. And if you hurt or kill them, then you will be killed in the same manner. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of the prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, remember chapter 8 and 9? Here he is. Here comes the Antichrist, the beast, the, the, the unholy trinity. The bottom pit shall make war against them. Now watch this. And overcome them and kill them. So the temple rebuilt. These two witnesses bring revival. I think hundreds and thousands are being saved. And all of a sudden, the, the beast comes against them, makes war, and kills them. Now, look at verse 8. This is sad. Their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, that's Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, which also our Lord was crucified. So we know it's Israel. There's a reason symbolically for Sodom and Egypt. We don't have time to deal with that. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations, now watch this, shall see their dead bodies for three and a half days and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. Wow, now, listen, listen to me. They're literally going to worship in the streets around these bodies. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another because of two prophets who tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them and they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither, harpizo. The same word back in Revelation 4 and 5 when he called the church, come up hither, rapture. You say the word rapture is not in the Bible. And they use the word trinity. But I sure thank God for the trinity, don't you? So here it is, Harpazo, that, that he will call the church and in like manner. He will raise these prophets back to life and then he will rapture them into heaven. And then that's when the Antichrist will take over in the city and in the temple. It's going to get bad. Now look at verse 13. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to God <clears throat> in heaven. The second woe was past. Behold, a third one is coming quickly. All right? So, everybody all right? <laughs> this is fun, isn't it? This, this is some tough stuff, all right? I, I'm just going to rehearse a few things with you, then I'll make some points, Okay. So, Miss Lisa, go ahead and put that first point up there, if you don't mind. Number one, the temple rebuilt. Let's talk about that. I just said a moment ago, in chapter 11 and in chapter 12, you're on Jewish ground. We see the Jewish temple rebuilt. Again, spoke to a guy who was in Israel, in Jerusalem, and he said, I saw the, the Levites being retrained to get ready to do that. The temple is that place that, that many of the Old Testament saints, where they attributed to the, the presence of God. They wanted, to, they wanted these temples. You remember Solomon built the temple of glory. It was destroyed. There was another one built. It was destroyed in A.D. 72. These temples sim symbolically represented the presence of God. And that's where the people would go to worship and they'd make sacrifice. So to the temple to them would be coming to our church. And so it was a big deal. But in the first three and a half years, this is important, they will be allowed to rebuild the temple or it will be built just previously before the rapture. Whichever, I'm okay. But it is ready to be built. They have everything ready, everything prepared to move into that and do that. So for three and a half years, there will be work done on rebuilding the temple. Everything will be getting ready to re-sacrifice, to worship, and do the work that God would have them to do. Not only their work, but their worship. 
This infuriates the Antichrist. They're worshiping the Lord God of Jerusalem. That's why I said, if you don't believe this, go home and read Revelation, I mean Romans 8, 9, and 10. God has not lost or broken his covenant with Israel. So not only will he work during that time, then they will begin to worship. This will infuriate the enemies of the Most High God. Let me just read this for you. Warren Wiersbe says, The place is Jerusalem, and the time is the first half of the tribulation. Israel is worshiped again in the restored temple, but under the protection of the Antichrist, whose character will be revealed very shortly. The temple John commissioned to measure is probably a reference to the temple <clears throat> the Orthodox Jews built during the tribulation. So their work, their worship, and, and let, let me say this, their word. I think what's happening now is they're beginning to proclaim the glory of God throughout the earth, and the Antichrist becomes infuriated. So they're working to build, they're worshiping, and then they begin to share um, what God is doing. Um, again, just let me make some references. Dr. Wilmington says, here John is put to work with a nine-foot ruler measuring a, tri a tribulation temple. The problem here, again, is the temple doesn't exist right now, so obviously he's speaking of the future of measuring a place that is real where people can come, where they can hear the word, and where God, once again, reestablishes his covenant with Israel. Listen to me carefully. Do not confuse the church with the nation of Israel. Don't confuse the covenant with Israel with the covenants of the church. Hebrews 11 says, we have a better covenant. And aren't you thankful? Yeah, absolutely. We have a better covenant. We have a better hope. All the things they had were blessings, but because of their rebellion and their refusal to obey God, God kind of wiped that all away for several thousand years, but it will be reestablished. That will happen in the rebuilding of the temple. And then when the temple is rebuilt and their work and their worship, and now the word is going out, all of a sudden the Antichrist shows up and he begins to cause all havoc. Not before, though, two mighty men show up. Here you go, two supermen. Bible says fire comes out of their mouth. The Bible says they can turn the water into blood and they can cause the heavens to stop or to be shut up. So let, let's look at these two men. There's been a lot of speculation on who these two men are. A lot. Are y'all ready? Uh, it's not your grandpa. <laughs> uh, but there's been a lot. Let's go to that next one, Miss Lisa. There, there's two witnesses that bring revival. We'll look at those two people for just a moment. Number one, the period of their ministry, the Bible says, will last for at least three and a half years. Who, who, who are these people? The Jewish temple has been rebuilt. The nation, though living in unbelief, is now worshiping again, and it seems like that the two witnesses minister during this time. So if you've got pen and pencil, you'll write this down, write it. Number one, most people would say that it is Elijah and Enoch. The reason being is this. Listen carefully. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. We know that Enoch, went out for a walk and just walked right on to heaven. He didn't die. <laughs> By the way, wouldn't that be a good way to go to heaven? Just go for a stroll? Elijah went up in a fiery chariot. Somebody said, that's a spaceship. Hey, that's fine with me. However, how you get there? You work it out. <clears throat> Most conservative scholars would say that it's Elijah and Enoch. Some, and I hate to use the word moderate, but some would say it's Elijah and Moses. Because they were in the Mount Transfigurated with Jesus in what, Matthew 17, some, somewhere? I may be misquoting, you can find that for yourself. So whoever it is, there are these two men that God uses in a mighty and a powerful way. So I, I want you to look at one other thing. I ran across this the other day, and, and this is just, if, if you see it, I don't want you to be shocked. Some people say that it's not people. Some people say that the two olive trees refers to the nation of Israel. And let me tell you why, because Israel is always referred to as an olive tree in the Bible. In the book of Corinthians, Paul said that God has taken the olive tree and grafted in an unnatural branch. Guess who that is? That's the Gentile. So, so let's look at it this way. He says, well, let's read the Bible together. Verse 4, these are two olive trees. Turn to Jeremiah, 20, uh, Jeremiah 11, just for a moment. Just for a moment. So who are these people? We know that the period... It's for three and a half years, but who are they? Um, Israel, <clears throat> when they came into the promised land, was divided into two groups of people. There were ten and two. You remember that? You had Judah and you had Israel. They even had their own temples. And so the two olive trees here could actually be referring to the nation of Israel. Now, most conservative scholars would tell you that's crazy and that's okay. But let me tell you where that comes from. 
comes from Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 16. The Lord called by name a green olive. Would you say that word? What? Green olive tree. Did Revelation 11 not just say that there's two green, there's two olive trees? Yes, two lampstands. By the way, the lampstand refers to the church. Remember back in Revelation 2 and 3? The, uh, Revelation 2, the lampstands is the church where God walks through the midst. That, that could be the church. But look what he says following that. A green olive tree, fair and godly fruit, with the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. That's when he judged them. But look in 17. For the Lord of hosts hath planted thee. Who planted Israel? God did. You all right, sis? We got an escaped convict. That's funny. For the Lord of hosts planted thee. That's awesome. Hath pronounced evil against thee. Now watch careful. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger and offering incense to Baal. So many, not conservative, but more moderate, I don't use the word liberal, more moderate scholars say he's probably actually talking about the nation of Israel as one of the witnesses. The entire nation, the temple's been rebuilt, they're worshiping again, the word's going out. I, I'm, I'm just saying it's there. I'm not saying it is. Uh, personally, I like Enoch and Elijah. I'm good with that. But if you're reading and you're studying prophecy, you may come along that. The two lampstands represent the church. Back in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, when he said that all the churches have this lampstand, and I walk among the lampstands. So you have the, the nation of Israel, and you have the church. And those are the two witnesses in Revelation number 11. Listen, doesn't matter who they are. This is important. They come to give glory to God. They come to proclaim the good news of the gospel and many people would be saved. And all the church said, yes. So whoever they are, God's going to use them. The period of their ministry we know, is, as he said, he counted the days will be three and a half years during that time the temple would be rebuilt and they will begin to preach and I believe people will come and go. Number two, the purpose of their ministry. It's found in verse 5 and verse 6. They will display God's power to the unbelieving Jews and any of the Gentiles who are left. Many of the Gentiles by now will be killed. No doubt many will be saved through their witness. Did you hear that? Many will be what? Saved. Hey, I got good news for you. Even when hell has a holiday, it can't stop God from sending a revival. And all the church said, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I've already got kind of fussed at for, for saying some political things. I don't care who's in the White House. They can't stop revival. Amen. Previously, now or the future. If the church of God wants to rise up in power, we can walk in the spirit of life and we can proclaim to the world Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And if people can get saved while hell's having a holiday, I'll tell you, they can get saved right now, 2021 20, January. Amen. So even in the greatest horrors of the world, God will have his witnesses, whether it's two men or the church and or Israel, God will have his mighty messengers out there proclaiming the good news of the gospel. Set the captive free. Thank God Jesus saves, Jesus saves. No doubt many will be saved through their witness. They're called prophets in verse 6 and 10, as well as witnesses. They will announce to the world and the great events to come and will incur the wrath of the beast and of the people who are alive in the world at that time. Because of the miracles they perform, these men are identified. Again, some say Moses, Elijah, some say Elijah, Enoch, whoever they may be. Uh, and, and because of some illustrations that they did, I'm good either way. So their purpose is to proclaim even in the midst of everything on that there's a God in heaven, that his covenant has been reestablished with Israel. That is so important that that covenant will be kept and will be honored. The Bible says, I am God and I cannot lie. And God says, I will keep my covenant with Israel forever. Now, does that mean God doesn't judge them? No. By the way, could I just say this? And let me, let me just say this tenderly. When I get into sin, I'm glad God judges me. That proves I'm a child of God. God's discipline is love. Listen, I, I don't like to discipline my little grandson, but if I love him, I will do what's necessary to keep him in the right place and do the right things. And correction and judgment is not that God hates you, it's that God loves you, that God cherishes that relationship. When a husband and wife keep one another in check, my wife's good at checking. Praise God. 
Where are you at? I don't know. <laughs> Boy, they can thank God for the ladies. And all the church said, hallelujah. Gets, gets hard sometimes, ladies, but uh, thank God. So the Lord sends these people to remind us that he loves them even in judgment and that his covenant. The Bible says they can turn water into blood. They can call fire out of heaven. They can shut up the heavens. These guys are some bad dudes. They really are. And so we need to thank God for that. Then in verse 7, so we see the period, three and a half years, we see the purpose is that uh, worship has been reestablished, the word's going out, people are getting saved, but then we see their persecution. The beast is not going to let this go on. Antichrist, whoever you want to call the Antichrist person. Sinful men will never want to hear or obey God's word. Did you hear that? Sinful man will never want to hear what God's word has to say. We're living in that climate today. They don't want to know what God said. They just want to know what feels good to them, what brings pleasure and prosperity, and don't bother me. Sinful men will never want to hear or obey God's voice. These two witnesses will be divinely protected until their work is finished. Do you see that? Look back there with me. Would you do that? Look at that. That's a, it's so easy to run past that. Don't, don't do that. Look, look at that. And when they have finished, verse 7, and when they have finished their testimony... Can, can I say something? Listen, come, come here close. One day you're going to finish your testimony. And when you do, God's going to call you home. Praise be to the Lamb of God. That's why death for us is not necessarily a, a, a terrible thing. Now we cry and we mourn. Told a family the other day, hey, this guy's been living for this his whole life. He's gone to receive the reward that he's been living for. Death for us is victory in Jesus. Read Romans chapter 8. What can separate us from the love of God? Death, persecution? No. And so these guys came to do what they're supposed to do. And when they got finished, God allowed them the beast. God allowed the beast. Are there times God allows the enemy to win? It looks like it. But in God's purposes, and God's preordained sovereign care, I'm glad that God knows what's best. I spoke with a family several months ago. And I said, can I give you guys some advice? If I were you, it's time for your loved one to go home. Why don't you go hug their neck, say I love you, and say goodbye. It's okay to go. That's some of the sweetest stuff you can do to release your loved one in the hope and in the love and mercy of God. If we believe Psalms 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art what? With me? I will fear no evil. So we see these witnesses, we see their period, we see their purpose. Now they come under intense persecution to the point, look at verse 7, and when they had finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit made war against them and overcame them and killed them. So God allowed, you need to hear that church, God allowed the beast to overcome them. Aren't you glad God's in control no matter what's going on? I may not like it, may not feel good, so the Bible says they come under intense persecution. Um, the citizens of Jerusalem will not even, uh, according to the Bible, the, the citizens of Jerusalem will not even give them a burial. L listen what they do. While they're laying dead in the streets, they dance around them. That is paganism at its height. Wickedness. That they would not even bury the dead. They let their bodies be desecrated openly. And they dance around and they party while these dead, hey, we need a little break right here, a little funny truth. When I was pastoring in Louisiana, we had a funeral at a home, and they had to get special permission. And I can't remember the guy's name. It seemed like it was John. Uh, it was Uncle John. And so we went to the people's house. Listen, they got Uncle John out of the casket, <laughs> propped him up at the gate, put a cigarette in his hand and a beer in one hand, and started taking pictures. Are y'all all right with that? That's the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. Well, Uncle John, you know, and of course, they, anyhow, I, I, it just turned wicked, and we had to call the cops to get John back in the coffin. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> How do you pray over that? <laughs> Please put him back in the... <laughs> Crazy. I, by the way, a lot of Louisiana folk, I love you guys, my, my former church. It's just Uncle John family went crazy. 
Jack Daniels probably had a lot to do with it, but they went crazy. The cities of Jerusalem will not even give them a burial, but the whole world, thanks to international television, will see their bodies and rejoice. I, I literally believe. Somebody said, how can the people in China and the people in America see the Lord come back? Television. Pretty easy to think. I mean, when it comes, you, every eye's going to behold him. I had a guy, he chatted one day, everybody can't see him at the same time. Yes, they can. If God who made the world put it in space wants to be seen, I promise you, he can do 3D all around the world. And the church said, yes. Praise his name. So the Bible said they're persecuted and ultimately they die. For three and a half days, I, I, I don't, just gonna, I'm reading some stuff here called Satanic Christmas. Three and a half days. Terrible. People will give parties, exchange gifts, and rejoice that the people who persecuted them are dead. Wow, we've got to hurry. One other real quick like Notice the panic. Uh, they're resurrected, uh, verse 11, and after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God enters them. Now, I, I, just, I, just, I just wished I could, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little sanctified imagination. Can you imagine Billy Bob Bad walking down the street, and there lays a dead man, and he gets up? I don't care who you are, that will give goosebumps. And all the church said, yeah, you think you're tough? Try that one out, big boy. Three and a half days, he'd been dancing around, jumping around, getting all of a sudden, the guy stands up, whoa, we got a problem. <laughs> I love this. Even though God allowed the beast to kill him, God will supernaturally, for the whole world to see, God will resurrect them in the face of everybody. And panic is going to break out. What is going on? Wow, this is great stuff. Hollywood can't think this stuff up. The Bible says they heard the voice come up hither, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched in absolute wonder. And then something happens. The Bible says the same hour. So Billy Bob Bad's walking down the street of Jerusalem. These two witnesses get up. They ascend back into heaven. And all of a sudden, the same hour, almost like the same time Jesus. You remember what happened when Jesus was resurrected? Earthquake and graves opened. Here it is again. The power of God. Listen to me. Not even the earth can handle the power of God when it touches it. Revolts. The Bible says an earthquake and a tenth part of the city fell and 7,000 men died and the remnant were so scared they gave glory to God. The second woe is past. Um, God raises them from the dead. Uh, think of the fear that will come to men's hearts around the world as they see these two men think that they're destroyed and gone and they're not. And then the two men will be caught up to heaven as their enemies stand and watch there will be rumblings, sounds, and then earthquake, and the earth will shift the plates in the earth, and 7,000 people will die. Hey, I want to leave you with two thoughts, with, with several thoughts before we go. Just leave that up there, sis. Not only are there two witnesses, now are you listening to me? The Bible says there's two words. There's the words of life, and there's the words of death. There's the words of truth, and there's the words that's a lie. You better know who you're listening to and what you're believing. Moms and dads in this room, moms and dads, if you have children, you have a high, holy responsibility to guard the ears of your little boys and girls. They are listening to stuff that you and I cannot even imagine. I pulled up next to a car the other day. I've been in, when I, before I got saved, I've been in bars that I hadn't heard that kind of language in my whole life. And our little boys and girls in junior high and early, in early high school years are hearing this stuff, the profanity and the debauchery. No wonder our society is going to hell. The words of life, the words of death. Can I say this? There's two worlds. If you were noticing yesterday, at 87 years of age, Larry King died. Maybe you saw the interview when he interviewed Billy Graham. And asked Billy Graham what he thought about death. To which, and I'm, I'm, I'm not quoting. Billy Graham said, I believe in two worlds. After you die, there's a heaven and there's a hell. And Larry King said, really? To which Billy Graham said, that's what the Bible says. And that's good enough for me. And the church said, it's two worlds, two places. 
Two words. Two worlds. Are you listening? There's two ways. There's the way that seems right. And it looks right. And it feels right. Hey, I don't mind telling you. I uh, coming back from Amelia Island. And I was coming through South Georgia. And the lottery went to a billion dollars. Did y'all see that? I got a little flesh left in me. I got to think, well, if I had a billion dollars, <laughs> I'd pay as many bills as I could before dark. Have y'all, don't act like you had never done it. Come on, be, be honest. Billion dollars? Man. <laughs> Can you imagine? And my mind just got, of course, the first thing I do, I'm going to give it to the Lord. I'm going to tie. You liar. I, I, I told the staff, if I want a billion dollars, the only thing you see out of me is hear a helicopter or a tail light. That's the last thing you'd hear or see. Be gone. Why? Because our flesh. Two worlds. There's two words. Mom and dad, there's two ways. And, and with heaven on our side, the Holy Spirit help us to lead our boys and girls to the foot of the cross. Because one day they are going to die. And they're going to meet Jesus. I'm going to say to you today, with, with all of this going on, these witnesses are reaffirming the covenant, reestablishing the temple. But there's two words, there's two ways, and there's two worlds. And we need to be telling the world, in spite of all the popular, political or not, Jesus still saves. The Bible is still true. And the church is still necessary. And I'm tired of apologizing for that. So why don't we just tell them? What a story, amen? I don't know who the two witnesses are. You figure it out. Go home and read. I've read so many books. My, I just, you go home and figure it out. It's okay. All I know is they're God's men. And they're going to bring about God's purposes. So one day the Lord's going to call us home. As a matter of fact, Revelation Chapter 5 says, and I saw all the saints of God around the throne of God. I want to begin with that first message. Did John see you? Most theologians believe that's a panoramic view of the past, present, and future of all the people who would be saved. And they're around the throne of God and they're bowing and they're worshiping. And if we were to take that picture today and flash it on the screen, would we see you there? Do you know that Christ has died for you, was raised three days later? And because of the blood sacrifice, the atoning blood of the salvation of the Lord Jesus, you can be saved. And I like what Paul says, for I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day, particular day. What day? Could be in Revelation 11. Are you ready for that? It's time to get ready. And all the church said, can I say this? The hour's late. The time is short. Get ready now. Heads your bow. Father, thank you for the book of Revelation. I know for many it's confusing. We don't know it all. We don't. We can, we can guess on some things, but we just don't. But to the best of our ability, we know that, Father, you, you sent the word to remind us to get ready. Because one day the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet them in the air then we'll get to go be with the Lord forever. I'm, I'm just asking today. I know the world's crazy. I know it's confusing. It really is. But who are you listening to? Two words. There's two ways. And there's two words. You've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice. Mom and Dad, I pray for you. How hard it is today help young people find their way. I pray for you that, first of all, I pray for a husband and wife that your relationship would be safe and secure, but I pray that God would help you as a mom and dad to gently, graciously help your young boy and girl find their way. That the Lord would give you that ability, that discernment to do that. Church, we're living in dangerous, dark times. It's time to come to the light. Somebody said the other day, Brother Ron, I believe that God separates church could be true it's time to get ready I, I, I don't know all the truth of revelation let me first tell you that's hard to interpret some of this but the message is pretty clear he's coming and there's 
two worlds out there. Are you ready? Will God prepare our hearts? Help us do that. And Lord, in Jesus' name, give grace and mercy to the one who's struggling. I pray for them today. I know the enemy loves to come to steal, kill, destroy. I want to pray for my brother and my sister. And God bless them. Maybe there's a marriage on the rock. Maybe there's an addiction. Maybe there's a failure. Maybe there's hate, bitterness. Whatever it may be today. Why don't you put your hand in his hand and say, Lord, give me grace. Give me mercy. Help me along the way. Father, we love you. Thank you for what you're going to do now. In Jesus' name. And all the church said, Amen. I hope the Lord bless you with this. I know some of this is uh, it just can be di difficult, but um, hopefully it'll help you. Hey, two or three things real quick, like as you leave today, uh, thank you for your faithfulness to give. The offering plates are there, but also if you want to sign up for the ladies' Bible study beginning in a couple of weeks, uh, Gideon, please go by. Uh, Miss Peffler will be doing that. You can call her and get your materials, whatever needs to be done there, okay? So please do that. Remember, this time next Sunday morning, uh, we'll stop just a few minutes early if I can quit preaching, and we'll have just a quick session We've already discussed the budget at 9.30 this morning. If you have a question, you can pick those up on the way out. Call the church office, call the finance committee, call me, and we'll be happy to, to, to help take care of that, okay? So if you have questions next Sunday, we'll just affirm that uh, as we go forward. Uh, also, we discussed allowing the deacons, uh, trustees, and finance committees to make any business decisions. There has to be at least six, three of each. There will be more, but at least six of those in the room to discuss any type of business that we may have. So going forward, if we have anything we need to do, but we can't have a church meeting, we'll allow the deacons, trustees, and the finance to do that. Hey, I did fail to mention a little bit earlier, Jason and Kelly Everett, if you're listening, uh, I'll counsel them this week. They're going to be joining our church real soon. Um, young couple, got a young baby. His mother, they thought, had a stroke Wednesday. Um, Couldn't find out she had a UT and she just got real sick. She lives in Kentucky. And so if you guys happen to be listening on Facebook, we're praying for you, Jason and Kelly, and pray the Lord be with you and keep you safe till you get back home. Please remember those who lost loved ones, Miss Vicki, and for uh, Mr. Pepper, and ask the, uh, Mr. Pepper, Pepper, uh, ask them, okay? Hey, anything else? Are we okay? Everybody all right? Y'all ready to go home? <laughs> all right, here's what we're going to do. Stand up, back row, just work your way out the room. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning in Jesus' name.